This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to the latest Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Matt Addison with Ian Doyle, Paul Ghost and Theo Squires alongside me. Here as we take a look back at Liverpool's biggest ever away win in the top flight. We'll take a look at the Crystal Palace game shortly and have a chat about a couple of awards being handed out as the end of 2020 nears. But first, Ian, there's a different update to bring you, and that is Virgil van Dijk. Let's start with the video that he posted this morning. It looks like he's taken the next step towards a potential recovery. Well, yeah, considering he had his operation on his cruciate ligament, uh, what was it, seven weeks ago, something like that, for him to be training as he was he was doing a bit of work clearly on his knee doing some weights but more importantly he was doing a bit of ball work it wasn't much but it was uh it's certainly more than i think any of us might have expected certainly if if i had an operation like that i probably wouldn't be so keen to be kicking a ball around less than two months into it uh there's a bit of a debate over where he actually was but certainly not kirby i think we've we've kind of worked out that it's in dubai at the nas sports complex there because i think he was out there with his uh, mate what's his name what's his mate that he was with Salt Bay, yeah. Salt Bay. Yeah, I don't know his actual name, but you'll all know which one he is. Um, so, yeah, that's good for Liverpool. I mean, there's no suggestion that he's anywhere near a return, and I don't think anybody, anybody's saying that. But it's just good that he's clearly making uh, some kind of progress. And, you know, Liverpool refused to rule him out when he uh, had the initial injury for the uh, rest of the season. So, I'm not saying he's going to be back. You know, I have no idea whether he's going to be back, but... It looks as though he's given himself every chance to perhaps be back a little bit earlier than anyone expected. And that's obviously a, a huge boost for, for Liverpool, Paul. Even just seeing him take this next step is enough to get a lot of fans very excited. Yeah, and, you know, fair play to them if they are getting excited because why Why wouldn't you be? You know, you, you're kind of assuming the Van Dijk's going to be off for the majority of the season and then you see him back um, doing his work with his rehab coaches at Kirby and now he's, he's off in Dubai actually working with the ball and it's all good news isn't it it's all positive news and the fact that it's all being fed out via social media lets you know that he wants people to know that it's all coming along nicely so yeah um, why not get excited by it and um, as Doyle says no suggestion that you're going to be back <clears throat> you know for the new year or, or anything like that Liverpool still looked into place a time frame on it which is understandable but um, it, it's it's good news it's all heading in the right direction and initially when, when the injury happened um we were told that um, well, there was no kind of he's not going to be off for X amount of time or whatever. Liverpool were very cautious in saying anything like that, but there was a kind of feeling that they were happy with Van Dijk as a person, his kind of positive attitude towards things, and the fact that he's got a very good injury record over his, the course of his time at Liverpool. So that all counted in his favour in his recovery. And you know, as Dodie says, what is it less than two months on since that? operation in London he's um, now working with the ball again so it does seem to be as, as though those um, reasons to be optimistic have, have been well founded. Yeah Theo I know you wrote a, a piece about the, the January transfer window and Premier League squad lists and stuff like that there's limits on the numbers of, of foreign players allowed in Liverpool's Premier League squad I suppose we'll get a, a hint in a few weeks as to whether Liverpool or or as is, is possibly the case or, or not the case, whether they think he might be back before the end of this season. Yeah, we will. Um, obviously, Marco Gruic, didn't he left on loan because Liverpool didn't have space in the squad for the foreign players before Van Dijk got the injury. And then Van Dijk's injury meant they could take him out of the squad. So there was that one space there. But if Liverpool are confident that he's going to be back before the end of the season, however long before the season, end of the season that's going to be, they will need to register him at the end of January, the start of February. So that Liverpool squad list will give us a big clue as to when they're expecting him to be back. Because if you don't name in that squad, you just, you're writing off the season. But for Van Dijk, for a personal point of view, he's the Netherlands captain. Netherlands, assuming the Euros goes ahead as originally scheduled, are hosting some games. He will want to be back for the European Championships. He will want to be in that squad uh, regardless of when he returns. But he needs a good run of games, you feel, before the tournament so he can prove his fitness. So maybe he's aiming for, I don't know, a May sort of return. Uh, we've seen him come back from long-term injuries before. I think before he um, joined Liverpool, he was out for a considerable period in his final year with Southampton. And we've seen players come back early from injuries before. I think Gibral Cissé is one obvious one for me that he surprised us with how quickly he could return from a serious injury from the broken leg the first time. Uh, but it's all individual basis, isn't it? Players recover at their own rates. Uh, the fact that it's Van Dijk, who has got a very good injury record compared to someone 
who I suppose like Alex Oxlade Chamberlain when he took a little bit longer to come back from his recent injury. Uh, it's positive signs. Good to see him kicking the ball. He's obviously wanting to put it out there, whether he's wanting to get fans excited and he's been a bit cheeky with it, or it is a genuine step towards recovery. We'll wait and see. Yeah, before we move on to the, the Crystal Palace game, Ian, there was the news this morning. Myself and, and Paul joined Christian Walsh to discuss Mohamed Salah being named the inaugural 2020 Premier League Reach PLC Player of the Year. Were you surprised that Mohamed Salah won that award? Um, given the fact that it's open to the fans and we know that every time there's a fan vote and Salah's involved, you know, the whole of Egypt seems to come out and vote. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised at Salah doing anything in that regard. I mean, he's not going to win that at Real Madrid or Barcelona, is he? So uh, it's one of those things. I mean, I'm slightly concerned that Jack Grealish finished second, given the fact that I couldn't even believe he was... We, we did this before, didn't we, uh, earlier this month. I couldn't believe he was actually in the final reckoning. I mean, uh, I think Kevin De Bruyne might be a bit unhappy about that. But, you know, was it a surprise that Salah got it? When you look at the fact that it's over the course of this year, look how many goals he scored already this season. And he did win the Premier League last season, and he was one of the not the top scorer in the league, but certainly one of the leading goal scorers, then, you know, I don't think anybody can doubt it in that regard, no. And Gorsty, we spoke about Virgil van Dijk there. Obviously, myself, you and Christian had a, an in-depth discussion on it this morning. And if, if people want to, to learn more about the award, they can go and, and listen to that podcast. But Virgil van Dijk was among the, the players that you picked out as, as your four on the shortlist for, for Liverpool. I suppose that it just goes to show, doesn't it? Liverpool have got players all over the pitch who, who could have been this in the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you were saying, Matt, it's, it's one of those things now with Liverpool where in previous... Um, looking across the Premier League, yeah, Liverpool's best teams have always had, you know, Steven Gerrard, just for his longevity. And then you've had maybe a, a Luis Suarez or a Fernando Torres or a, a Robbie Fowler or a Michael Owen. That doesn't mean too many kind of, you know, it, it, it's always been the quality around the top players that, that's often let Liverpool down in trying to win the Premier League or, you know, other major honours. But now, everywhere across the, the squad is, is top class and, and that is the reason why they're, they're in the position they are, the, the, the reason they've got the status and the reputation that they, they have at the moment. Because, you know, they're all top players. You know, it could have been anyone, couldn't it? Sadio Mane. Virgil van Dijk, obviously Salah has won it. Um, Trent and uh, Andy Robertson were unlucky not to miss out, or unlucky to miss out rather. Fabinho has been fantastic at centre back and at the, in midfield. Allison, best goalkeeper in the world. So, so everywhere you look across the squad, it's it's a team that's um, full of quality, and that is why they're, they're comfortably champions, and that is why um, they're probably going to retain their title. And just before we move on to, to Crystal Palace, Theo, were there any players that you think from Liverpool should have, have made that list or, or should have been a, a little bit higher up in the reckoning? Um, Trent wasn't on the Liverpool shortlist, was he? I thought Trent would be higher up there. But I think it was one of those where when you're doing it over the full year, it's when the vote's being made, when the shortlist's being drawn up, you can see the players in the mix. The fact that um, Mohamed Salah, I reckon he deserves it based on what he's been like since the start of this season. But we wouldn't have been saying that at the end of last season just because there are players that had stood out more than him, like Sadio Mane, Jordan Henderson. And, but then it's when you look at the numbers over the year as a whole. And I know Doyle's just mentioned De Bruyne will be upset, but you see he didn't even win the Manchester City one. Riyad Mahrez yeah. did. <laughs> so I think that says a lot about uh, African fans when they come out and vote their players, their talismans. But um, Salah's a deserved winner for Liverpool, I reckon. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on then, Doily, to the 7-0 win at Selhurst Park. You were there. And I'm not really mm. sure where to start with this one because it's probably not the worst performance you've seen. No, I don't think I've ever been to a game or ever seen a game where there's been so many really good goals. I mean, Liverpool could have had a, could have their goal of the season competition just from that game, which you know sounds ridiculous, but anybody, I assume everybody's seen the goals. They were just phenomenal. And, you know, the game itself, the first half, Liverpool got the great start with the the, first, the goal. After was after three minutes from Minamino, and that that helped him because he ended up being one of you know several Liverpool players who had a good game. But then for about 20, 25 minutes, Liverpool were they were second best to a lot of the balls. When they did have the ball, they weren't using it properly. You know, Trent in particular had a bit of a tough time down down the flank with uh, you know Eze and uh, Zaha kind of I won't say targeted him, but they got a lot of joy there. And Palace had one or two you know decent half openings. Because you look at it and you think, well, what save did Alison Becker have to make? I think he had to make one save from, I think it was a 
a Jeremy Schlupp header, I think it was. That was about it. Um, part of that was down to the fact that Fabinho had such a good game at centre back, certainly in that like twenty minute period. And that's you know, as Gorsi said, that's what Liverpool have got all the way through the team. You mean you've got a, a world class defensive midfielder playing at centre back, probably playing just as well as any of the centre backs that for Liverpool have played since the turn of the year, because people forget that you know towards the end of last season, certainly the start of this season, you know Virgil Van Dijk and Joe Gomez weren't massively on top of their game. I think after Van Dijk got injured, Gomez kind of was coming round to a little bit of form, and then he obviously got his injury while with England. But you know, Fabinho has been you know fantastic, and I think you know without wish to look too far ahead at the transfer window, I think I think possibly his form and the fact maybe Van Dijk could be coming back early. I think it might, that might influence Liverpool into perhaps not going for a centre back. Certainly not in January, but going going back to the game itself. I mean, once you know the second and the third goal, third goal in particular. I mean, if Liverpool score a better team goal than that this season, certainly on the counter attack, I'd be very surprised. Given the fact that you know starts with Trent, Firmino had an excellent game, puts it across to to Robertson, is then he's, he's on the end of it, and then when Henderson scores the the fourth goal, the second half just becomes a an example of what a team that's in form and ahead and playing against a side that you know, okay, the lack of fans probably hampered Crystal Palace to a certain extent because I don't think Liverpool would have won 7 nil. had there been you know anyone who's been to Sellers Park knows what that place is like when there's the home fans are in there I don't think it would have finished 7 nil with people in there but Liverpool did what they had to do and, and the contrast is with what Tottenham did the last week they went 1-0 up then they sat back because that's what the Mourinho Jose Mourinho Jose Mourinho sorry his teams do and that's why they've got as far up the league as they as they have done but Liverpool have got all these other extra strings to their bow that when they went one nil ahead they just went we're going to we're going to keep on attacking and that's why they ended up winning seven nil and as i say you know i've, I've seen liverpool what was it now win seven two win seven nil lose seven two this season alone and uh and without wishing to make myself sound absolutely ancient i was actually there for the nine nil when liverpool beat crystal palace in 1989 so both the biggest home and away wins uh have come in the top flight have come against crystal palace and i was there to see both of them as Doyle says there, Gorsty, I mean, Palace drew one each with Spurs with fans. They lost 7-0 to Liverpool without fans. How much do you think it was down to that? And how much do you think it was just down to how brilliant and, and how clinical Liverpool were? Yeah, I, I don't think it made a massive difference not having fans in there. I thought, I thought Palace just... Uh, I mean, I, I don't think they played particularly badly in the first half on, on Saturday, but I watched them against... Spurs and, and they, they, they played very well. They, they created a number of opportunities and probably on another day should have won it. Uh, they created more than enough to, to win that game. But um, I think the second goal really took it out of them because they were on top. They were really pressing for an equaliser and then Liverpool just had the blue go up the other end and, and just stick one in with, with Sadio Mane. And I think I think that was the, the killer for them. And then the third one just before half-time was just completely deflated them and then it's been Liverpool's. Liverpool's game to go and do whatever they please with then and, and um, they didn't take the foot off the gas did they? I think there was a I mean you only had to look at Sadio Mane's reaction to getting substituted to Liverpool knew that there was goals to be had in, in that game and um, when he came off with still you know 35 minutes left on the clock you could tell that um, they, they felt like they could have run up the score and, and that is ultimately what they've done and on a day when all three have come three points and you know not many teams are going to be able to live with Liverpool um, and, and that was obviously the case. So um, I thought Liverpool were, were excellent second half. Um, probably a little bit fortunate to be going in three 0 up in the first half. But um, this is what a, a top team does, you know, kind of rides the storm and then um, make sure that you take the big chances when they rise. And, and they're so excited with it in that final third in that penalty area. That um, if uh, if the front three continue to click like that, I mean, it was a bit reminiscent of. 17-18, wasn't it, when they scored 91 goals between them? If um, if it carries on clicking like that over the next few weeks and months, then I don't think we'll have to worry too much about the, the issues at centre-back. Was this the weekend, Theo, that everyone sort of realised just how good Liverpool can be when you think that you know they've got players coming back from injury as well? Was this a, a real statement performance and result for you? I think it's the weekend where everyone realised that Liverpool are the best team in the country and that they're the favourites for the title. Um, but all season so far, we've been thinking it's going to be a really tight t uh, title race, and that is basically just been a case of being in the mix when fans are all welcome back in and who can finish strongest. But Liverpool, in what half a week, 
have gone from being second with a much inferior goal difference to top by four points with the best goal difference in the division. And when you look at the injury list, it's got shortening. The players, they've still got to come back. And the fact they are putting performances like this without half the, the best events, when you've got Joel Matip, who we all know his injury record, you've got Fabinho technically out of position. Um, they spent, uh, what is it, 25, 30 million on Thiago, this marquee signing, and they've only seen him for a game and a half. And it's like, well, we know his world-class quality. And they're just going to get better and better. This is Yotta out for two months as well, when the front three have done that well with Minamino. It's just, wow, this is a really special team that we've put together. It wasn't just a case of um, they'll win one title and that's enough for them. Jurgen Klopp is trying to build something special. And while there will be a time when he has to break up this team, look to the future and take it to the next stage, um, I think you can look at this side now and think, well, they're at their peak, aren't they? They've got a couple of years left in them where they could all perform at these high levels. And they turn it on when they need to. Um, we've had this spell for a while now where they've been having European games, haven't they, every midweek. And that travelling's obviously taken its toll. The fact that it was only going to London for this week and they've got this full week off has definitely worked in their favour. They're going to have more time on the training pitch now. I think they're going to get better and better. And this is with all these injuries we've had all season. It's like, well, what else could they have done? They're in the best position in the league, full steam ahead. You could probably pick out, Doyle, a fair few individuals in that Liverpool team. But I think Jordan Henderson, for me, was one that, that stood out as being absolutely exceptional. I think he had the same number of touches as Keita and Wijnaldum put together during the course of the 90 minutes. And it's just the latest example of him really just running the show and, and dictating how this Liverpool team play. Well, he was certainly dictating how they were playing by how he was shouting at them, because obviously with no fans, I know we've picked up on this quite a few times this season, certainly with, with behind closed doors, but... Whether it was because we were a bit close to the pitch at Palace, I'm not sure. But he was unbelievably loud and he was just on it to every single player. There was something that happened very, very early on where Trent Alexander-Arnold went, went up and he lost the ball on the wing. And he, he turned around and didn't sprint back. And Palace lost the ball eventually, but Henderson absolutely laid into Trent. And that just didn't happen again in the sense of Trent didn't do that again the entire match. And it's not just that, it's that when he's... When somebody does something good, he'll say, you know, well played. You know, he was, he was reassuring to, to cater all the way through the game. And it was almost like he was directing uh, Sadio Mane at some points by telling him to go and close people down. Because I think people forget, you know, Mane played on the right, uh, which was, you know, not unusual for him in the sense he's done it loads of times in the past. But it's unusual in, in the last couple of seasons because, you know, Minamino for me, he came on, he came in, and that's his best position on the left side of, of the forward line. He, that's where he did his best football towards the end of last season when he, he after lockdown, where he was one of Liverpool's better players. But going back to Henderson, he uh, there was actually a spell in the first half where he was he, he was guilty as, as anybody of, of perhaps giving the ball away a little bit too much. But I think match you know, match of the day, they pointed out how he's able to drop into the fullback positions when the likes of Alexander Arnold and Robertson, who I thought was very good on uh, on Saturday, that he, he allows them to, to get forward. And you know, it, the fact that he then got his goal in such a you know such a great strike, a little bit like his one at, uh, at Brighton, wasn't it? Just before he got injured back in July, and, and you know some people point out it was a little bit like Steven Gerrard at Marseille. Although I wouldn't say he was quite as good as that. Um, it was still a great strike, and it, more like the Luton Town one. Yeah, the Luton Town. It's more like the Luton Town. That's probably right. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it was you know it was deserved. But then he's been like that ever since he came back from injury. We've seen what what he what he can do, and when he's not playing, bear in mind that last, last week he was playing centre back for the second half at Fulham. So that kind of you know, so he's he's been filling it both full back, centre centre back, midfield, and he's also back playing in that defensive midfield role because Fabinho's playing at uh, playing at centre back. So it underlines how versatile he is, and obviously he you know he just missed out on the BBC Sports Personality of the Year award, but. If, if they were giving out, you know, that for, for Liverpool players within the squad, I'm pretty sure that Henderson would win it every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Another one that I wanted to, to pick out, Gusty, was Sadio Mane because he hadn't scored for Liverpool in his nine previous matches, but he took that goal absolutely superbly. He did. Uh, first of all, the, the perfect team for him, really, because he, he loved scoring against them. I think he scored in seven games against them now. Um, so we were probably looking at the fixture list, thinking, oh, I haven't scored for a while, and then seeing Palace on his eyes have lit up. Um, yeah, he, he took it superbly, didn't he? And it, it was more, it was the turn, wasn't it, to open up the chance? It was almost like a creek turn on the edge of the box to get away from, I think it was Klein, was it? And then it's almost a, a topo past the uh, Guaita. He must have wondered what was going on because he didn't have a bad game at all. And 
um, who should be picking the ball out of the net every every five minutes. Um, strange, strange one for him, and it, it was great to see Mane kind of get that off his back because um, I don't think his performances have shown that he hasn't been in goal scoring form. I must admit, when I found out, I think it was possibly at eight or, or seven games a few weeks back. I, I was a little bit surprised that it had been that long, it's just because he hasn't been out of form. He just obviously hasn't been found in the back of the net. So um, it, it was, it was. It was a good day for Liverpool's forwards. Um, for me, you know, you know, obviously a man in form now, and hopefully those two goals will kick him on, and, and he'll go on a bit of a, a score and run. And then, you know, Salah's been doing that all season, hasn't he? You know, I thought his two goals were um, kind of encapsulated everything that he's about. With the first one being a bit of a poacher striking, and the second one, you know, a, a fantastic uh, killer. Um, so great day all round, and, and um, Liverpool's front three will be. Um, Licking their lips at the site of West Brom on, on the 27th. Yeah, it felt like a, a big day, didn't it, Theo, for Roberto Firmino? It's actually a year on today from Liverpool winning the Club World Cup, in which he, of course, scored the, the winning goal in that one. It, it sort of feels like he's got back to a similar level in the last couple of games to, to what we were used to seeing every single week around 12 months ago. Yeah, definitely. I think if you think a few weeks ago where he was in these goal scoring positions, and he almost was overthinking it. You could tell he was low on confidence and he was desperate to get a goal. Um, and then Crystal Palace, it was like instinct took over. He's got his confidence back, helped by the header against Spurs. It's just everything he did was sublime. Um, the the one-two of Robertson for the first goal was incredible. And then the second goal, it's like, well, he almost shouldn't be able to score from that position. It almost looks like the keeper's got both hands on it because he's gone so far wide. And he still found a way to chip him over and put it in the corner. It's the only way he could finish it, but it's a brilliant show from him. I think when we were uh, analysing his performances earlier in the season, where comparing it to his Brazil games and he perhaps wasn't at his best, they were saying, well, for Brazil, he was allowed to get in the box more. He was allowed to show that attacking instinct more. And it's basically what he was doing against Crystal Palace. It's certainly how he scored his first goal, having that desire to get in the box. And Firmino is a player that when he's got a smile on his face and he's playing well, you can't stop him. And the smile is definitely back. It's been a strange year, 18 months for him. I think um, if you really want to analyse it, if you go back to the injury he got before the Champions League final, he's been hot and cold since then. He's had his great moments, obviously, scoring in the, the Club World Cup final last year and he had a nice little run there around Christmas. But he has had some lengthy goal droughts in amongst it all as well where the confidence levels drop and Jurgen Klopp's had to come out and back him and say how important he is. Uh, but now he's looking like the Firmino of old. And while he might not be able to do a 17-18 uh, season where he's going to get 20-30 goals, if he's providing the goods and you've still got uh, Mohamed Salah, Sadio Mane, and now you've got Minamino and Diogo Yotta as well, well, you can't stop Liverpool because these front five, when they're given the opportunities, they're just going to be incredible and they'll destroy you if you let them on the ball as Crystal Palace found out to the peril. I think one of the, the many positives to, to come out of the match, Ian, for me, was the fact that Liverpool put in that performance, but they've still got plenty of players to come back from injury. We could see Thiago Alcantara, Zedan Shaqiri, James Milner come back to team training very soon. And I suppose that just underlines the, the sort of, not just the, the results and the performances that Liverpool have put in to get themselves into this position, but the difficulty for the rest of this Premier League that Liverpool are now just going to get even stronger over the next few weeks. Well, the interesting thing on that is that how many of those players are going to come in and go straight into the first team? I think uh, Klopp had a good... He said something... Basically, he was responding to what Jose Mourinho said after the Tottenham game. Where he, well, before the Tottenham game, wasn't it? Where he said, everyone's talking about Liverpool's injury list, but look, this player's playing, this player's playing, this player's playing. And that was fair enough. Klopp agreed with that and said, There's better, apart from the two centre-backs, you could argue that's Liverpool's first-choice team, or certainly very much near to it. The problem has been that they've not been able to rotate many people out. When they have done, it's been a lot of the youngsters have been coming in. So the players that are coming back, they it's it's good time if they are back this week because you know I think they've got four games in the next in 13 days, starting with the West Brom game on Sunday and ending with the the FA Cup game at Aston Villa and the, and you know Newcastle away and Southampton away. They're not going to be particularly easy games. Certainly not easy games to get to. I'll tell you that it's a long way away. Um, it's bad enough going to to, to Fulham and Crystal Palace. That's a bit of a trek. Um, but going back to the point, yeah that. They're going to have these options. They'll be able to mix and match. And that's where perhaps something they didn't have, you know, for about, you're right, Liverpool, that they are four points clear, although you could say it's really two points with the games down that some other clubs have got. They're, they're clear after 14 games because we're not, 
I know Liverpool are top of Christmas for the third year running, but it's not quite the same. I think they're about four or five games behind where they would normally be. So you're looking at mid-January is probably, that's the kind of realistic comparison that you have to make. But they're top and then they won through the Champions League group with the game to spur. It does show that perhaps, as you mentioned, Liverpool are not only still the best team in the Premier League, but they're probably a better team and a better squad and the the better organised and, and, and better trained than perhaps a lot of people realise. And this isn't something that's just happened overnight. They haven't just won one Premier League. They, you know, they won the Club World Cup before they won the Premier League. They won the Champions League before they won the Premier League. This has been building for a while. And what they've now got is the players who are coming through, the youngsters, they're able to, they can see what's needed. They train. You know, a lot of these have been training with the first team squad for about a year now. That's why they can come in and make a difference because they know how the team plays. But yeah, that you have got the likes of Shakiri and Milner and that bloke called Thiago, who they apparently signed in the summer. Don't know about him. Don't know anything about him. Uh, he will be, as Klopp said, he will be like a, he'll be like a new signing. I know we, it's the old cliche, but he actually will be because he's only played 135 minutes. And I, think I wrote a piece the, the other day that Liverpool's three summer signings, you know, Simicass has barely played. You know, Thiago's played 135 minutes. And, and Jota, you know, he's, he's been very well when he's played, but I think between them all, they've had about five 90-minute 90, 90 performances. It's been more on the the kids, the likes of Curtis Jones, the likes of, you know, Reese Williams, Nico Williams, that, Liverpool, that have helped Liverpool get into this position now that when all the players start coming back, it's from a position of strength where they're holding on to something rather than trying to catch up with everybody else. I think it says a lot, doesn't it, Gorsi, that even though someone like a Thiago or a Shakiri is coming back, the players who've stepped in have been so good, and I include Henderson, Wijnaldum, Curtis Jones in these. It's not just a given that Liverpool will change up their squad. It is more a case of it's great that they're back because now we can rotate. Definitely. I think if everyone who's injured at the moment for Liverpool comes back for the West Brom game, I think the only one who definitely take his place would be uh, Van Dijk. Uh, Thiago, obviously, is, is a top player, but he's only made two appearances and he's only played one full game. And nearly into January. Um, he's played 135 minutes and I think only Oxlade-Chamberlain has played less than that in the squad and that's only because he's played 15 minutes and he's been injured all season. So um, the idea that he walks back into the team is not uh, not necessarily a given, even though we all know that he's he's a top quality midfielder. It's going to be great kind of watching him learn, learn the works over the coming weeks and months once he does get into the team and, and you know, just watching him in the Merseyside derby show the... Um, it's going to be fascinating to, to kind of see him when he's on song. Um, Jota is another one, but, but again, he's someone who's kind of forced his way into the reckoning um, just from his performances early on in the season. So I think um, Liverpool are, are looking good once they get two or three injuries back. It's, um, it really is looking like a, a healthier pitcher than it was maybe even a fortnight ago, to be fair. And um, everything seems to be uh, heading in the right direction at the moment. Nabi Keita back as well. I'll stay with you, Gorsty, for this one. I mean, how much uh, of a big thing do you think it is for him? I mean, if nothing else, just to get through the ninety minutes seemingly without another injury. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's just like it's just Groundhog Day, isn't it? With with Keita, it's just the, the same cycle that he's been in for two and a half years. You know, come into the team, play well, show encouraging signs, have a little bit of a run, then pick up an injury and be missing for for X amount of games. Come back in, and then the cycle starts all over again. So. Um, I wouldn't be wouldn't be getting too optimistic or too excited at the moment because we know that this does tend to happen with Cater, but uh, it was a good, solid step in the right direction. I thought he was good. Um, he wasn't um, wasn't kind of I wouldn't say it was fantastic and a brilliant performance, but it was it was solid. It was good. He did quite a bit of defensive work when he needed to and used the ball well. And um, just good to see him get some minutes under his belt because um, that is has been the only thing that, that's kind of stopped them building up any other steam and, and showing what he can do. Let, let's not forget, he's a £52 million midfielder, so um, more will be expected when he's up and running and he's flying and he's he's got a good run of games under his belt, but um, he just hasn't been able to do that as he crosses the Liverpool career. So um, small steps, but uh, going in the right direction at the moment. One of the things I'd say about Keita is I don't think it's any surprise that Liverpool scored them seven goals when he was in the starting lineup because... He's a midfielder who his first thought is to play the ball forward. And I think he, he was it was two of the goals that certainly the second one came from his ball forward to the edge of the area was the scramble and ended up with Firmino finding Mane. And it was his good ball up to the right that um, set up helped Alexander Arnold set up the fourth one for Henderson. 
And while he does obviously have his critics because sometimes he looks a little bit slight, which I actually thought he put himself about quite well at Palace on, on Saturday, is that Liverpool, over recent weeks, when they had to reconfigure things because of the centre-back situation, they've looked to... You know, the forwards have had to kind of do things a little bit for themselves, a little, certainly away from home. There's kind of Liverpool have looked to be solid and not give away too much in midfield, which is why perhaps you know they, they took the lead, uh, took the lead at Brighton and didn't didn't hold on to it. They got a draw out of Fulham. Neither performance were particularly great, and they didn't create an awful lot of chances. Uh, but with Keita in the team, he's able to link up with the front three. And I think. There's certain games now where he'll be needed to do that, and you know, Curtis Jones has tried to do that a little bit when he's been in there. And you look at the, the you know, the uh, the game in midweek. He it was his run into the box that you know Salah scored from, and then it was his run against Fulham that earned the free kick. So Liverpool needs somebody like that, and Kate is able to do that, not necessarily by running with it, but by actually passing it. And that's where I think he'll be quite crucial. As Gorsty said, no one ever really doubts his talent; it's just his durability. And if he can get a few games together. He'll, he'll be somebody who can make a big difference. Another one as well, Theo, is obviously Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain in terms of being able to link the sort of defence, midfield and attack together. And I suppose it was important for Liverpool that he got a few minutes under his belt as well. Yeah, he's been back for a couple of weeks now, hasn't he? And he's not had the opportunity to get on the pitch yet. Um, it's good for him to get some minutes under his belt. But it's going to be a tough few months for him, I feel, just because we've got so many options in that midfield. It's whilst he's had his spell on the sidelines this time that so many players have come to form, like Curtis Jones has leapt up that pecking order. It's like he's got it all to prove yet again. I think, well, it's only a couple of years ago he was one of the first names in that midfield before he got his first bad injury. It's just like he was linked with the transfer, wasn't he, last summer? Uh, he's another one of those players that might have an eye on the European Championships. It's like, well, he's going to have to prove that he's still deserving of this place in a Liverpool team and that he can be more than a squad player. He's obviously a very useful player to have because he's got such versatility. Like, they can put him in the front three on either flank. He's done the false nine role a couple of times. He's obviously very good in midfield getting forward. But when they've got so many now midfield players getting forward, it's like, well, how is he going to get that run of games to prove his fitness, uh, to show some consistency, even when he has put the injury woes behind him? But he's a very likeable player in the squad. He's obviously got this talent. Uh, he's versatile. He's a very good player to have going forward. And it's just, well, can he prove it on a more long-term basis? I think you compare that the knee injury he had, Jurgen Klopp said the absence, the layoff would be similar to the time Jordan Henderson had. Well, he's already been out, what, a month longer than that. So it's definitely playing catch-up for him. The fact that we're nearing the halfway stage in the season, but he can be another one that's like a new signing, using that old cliche. After Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. Just before we finish then, the BBC Sports Personality of the Year was announced last night. Liverpool named Team of the Year for the first time since 2001 under Gerard Houllier. Jurgen Klopp named Coach of the Year as well, Ian, just a couple of days after getting that FIFA Best Coach of the Year award as well. On both occasions, though, he was very quick to praise his staff and, and the people around him. And I suppose rightly so, with Pep Linders, Peter Kravitz and all the rest having played a huge part for Liverpool. Well, he, he said it the other day, didn't he? He came up with a quote, I think it was when he was asked about that FIFA award, where he said, I wouldn't say I'm the best coach in the world, but I'd say I've definitely got the best coaches in the world around me. Which, that's the, that's the kind of team ethos that he's looked to in, inject. I was going to say Melwood then. Well, it was Melwood initially, now it's Kirby. But... Um, you know, ever since he first walked in, wasn't he? he? He wanted everybody to feel part of the same, don't want to use the old cliche, but LFC family. But that's exactly, you know, it's a cliche because it's true. It's like most cliches. So that that's exactly what he's been able to achieve at the club. And they wouldn't be where they are now if they weren't all pulling together in the same direction. But there always has to be this kind of figurehead or person who's leading the way. And it just happens to be this charismatic football manager who's come in and, from the minute he, he came in, it's he, he, like the, the city, certainly the, the red half, not so sure on some of the uh, the, the blues in the city, so aren't so keen on him. Um, but he's coming, he's been welcomed with open arms and he's he, he's kind of, he's bought into it as well, hasn't he? He's bought into the whole Liverpool ethos, the, the history of the club. But with, while always looking forward, maybe he, he wanted to take the backpack of history. They are often, you know, they've, they've done that and then they've, they've put loads of stuff in a new one that whoever takes over he's gonna to have to carry that one so that's going to be tough for them but you know he's going to be around for a good few years yet and uh 
he was deserving of the award. Liverpool were deserving the award, though obviously I, I personally think it should have been the St. Helens Rugby League team that should have won it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jordan Henderson just picked to the award go, Steve, by Lewis Hamilton, the, the main prize for, for sports personality of the year. But I suppose it, it just sort of shows how far he's come as well, that he was even on that short list to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I've, I've seen I've seen quite a lot of people on, on my Twitter feed last night kind of complaining that um, Lewis Hamilton was, was beating Henderson to it and questioning the the, the, the sport but uh, it, it's more about what what you've kind of done off the pitch just as much as what you've done in your field isn't it or your you know your track and I think Hamilton's done done a lot of good work kind of looking to diversify F1 and Henderson was kind of recognised for a lot of his work um, helping out the NHS and the Players Together initiative and so on um, so I, I don't think Henderson needs or, or wants the BBC Sports Personality to the world I think he knows that his efforts are recognised by Liverpool's fan base, by the players and, and everyone associated with with the football club and the, and the sport as a whole. So um, he's, he's someone who doesn't necessarily want the attention on him anyway. So I think um, he'll have been pleased to have been uh, given a little nod and a little bit of recognition and, and uh, probably relieved that he, he hasn't been embarrassed by uh, getting up on stage and, and picking up the winner's award. But uh, yeah, he, he's been fantastic, hasn't he, as a person and as a player for quite some time now and, and he's the the ideal person personality to to lead Liverpool Football Club because it's um it's a particularly demand of one as captain it's it's more than what you do on the pitch it's relaying messages around certain events and certain anniversaries at the right time and striking the right tone and he's someone who just always does it to uh, to to vet, you know almost perfection with, with the way that he, he goes about it yeah, missed out on that award, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of other silverware for him to lift before the end of this season. I think that just about brings us to the end of today's podcast. No team selector or match predictions to be made because, of course, Liverpool have a rare midweek off. We'll be back with another Blood Red podcast later in the week. We also have a few specials to bring you before Christmas Day too. For now, though, from myself, Matt Addison, from Ian Doyle, Paul Ghost, and Theo Squires, until next time here on the Blood Red channel. Thank you for joining us and goodbye for now.